Hello and welcome to the overview of chapter 46 of Guyton and Hall's Medical Physiology textbook. In this chapter, we go over the basics of the neurosystem, going over exactly what the nervous system is made out of and how it transmits its signals. If you enjoy the chapter, please don't forget to give it a like and subscribe to the channel. And if you want to support the channel, you can go through the Patreon link and get access to audio files to listen on the go. So it starts off by talking about the different components in a basic level of our nervous system. So we have our sensory receptors, which obviously sense any changes to the environment. So that includes our pain, touch, temperature, taste, smell, all of those senses. And then that all gets transmitted to the higher senses, which you know starts off with the spinal cord, it goes through the spinal cord and then may go to the reticular substance. So that's more your brain stem. So your medulla, palms, mesencephalon. You may go up to your cerebellum, thalamus, or areas of your cerebral cortex. So those are more your where the information gets processed. If you then need to respond to that sensory stimuli, that another signal now goes towards your motor nerves. So you can perform motor functions. So that may go to your skeletal muscles, so then you actually move a limb or you get out of the way. It may result in contraction of smooth muscle in your internal organs. Maybe you go to rest or digest. And then also secretion of substances from your endocrine or exocrine glands. So there is this input, there's a processing, and then there's an output. And that's shown here in this figure 46.2, where you have your input, goes to your processing centers and then there's an output to your muscles or your joints. In this one 46.1 this is the basic neuron that transmits these signals. We have dendrites which was where your sensory receptors are going to be. So any changes in these dendrites which we'll get to later on in this chapter may result in an action potential through your axon and then ends up going to your synapses which will then send it through the spinal cord or go through the higher centers of the brain and decide what to do with that input. Now there's a lot of sensory input happening on a day-to-day -day basis and 99% of it actually just gets ignored. You're getting constantly bombarded with sensory information and you only process a very small amount of it which is relevant for your survival at that point in time. By the time it actually gets sent over to the integrative system which is going to process it, you can see that that one signal is going to be sent to multiple different synapses. And then that will either result in facilitatory or inhibitory signals to various regions. So that will help us to actually respond to that signal, whether one area of the brain gets stimulated or inhibited, and then you get a signal the other way to the motor end. And then we can also store information, and that's called memory, and that all occurs in your cerebral cortex. And that is just a pathway which remains able to be accessed and then that means that if you experience that same sensory feeling or something along those lines, there's already a pathway to use and that's called facilitation. So just because you already have that signal ready to go and that also allows us to think as well. So there's really three main regions to our central nervous system. We have the spinal cord, we have the lower brain or subcortical level and that's more your brain stem and then you have your higher brain or cortical level and that's more your cerebrum or this big chunky bit at the top and then the lower brain is your brain stem cerebellum region and then you have your spinal cord down here at the spinal cord level you're mainly just dealing with reflexes so a sensory information goes in it loops back to the motor nerve right next to that sensory area to then cause a reflex. So you don't even know that it's occurring. It doesn't actually reach the higher level of the brain before you actually do the motor action. There will be a concurrent signal at the same time so you know something has happened, but you don't need your brain to process that information in order for the motor unit to contract. For instance, if you touch a hot plate, you're gonna instantly feel an extreme temperature then you're gonna have a reflex arc straight to your motor neuron to then pull your arm away from being burnt. You're still gonna sense it and you're still gonna feel the pain because there will be a signal going up to your brain, but you're gonna pull back before you're actually recognizing that you need to pull back. So your lower brain or your subcortical brain, that involves your medulla, your pons, mesencephalon, hypothalamus, thalamus, and your cerebellum and basal ganglion. So like I mentioned, it's all this region around here. 
um, which includes your kind of subcortical brainstem level, which also get involved in more autonomic functions or normal homeostatic mechanisms. That's not where you're thinking, so that's more involved with just maintaining a normal body system to keep absolutely at the basic level. And then we have your higher brain, so that's just cerebrum, and that's where your memory is stored, that's where you're thinking, and that's where all the higher level actions come from. It does mention here that it's pretty similar to a computer where you just have inputs, processing, and outputs, and that's facilitated through having multiple synapses, which helps to spread the signal to a certain direction and stop us going in another direction. And there are two major types of synapses. So you've got chemical, meaning that there's an actual chemical being moved across that synapse as shown up here. We have some kind of chemical or neurotransmitter that's jumping this gap, which is called the synaptic cleft, to then result in either an action potential on this side or inhibiting this neuron from firing. So we either have a chemical sig signal or an electrical signal, as shown in this bottom diagram here, where the electrical signal just instantly crosses through these gap junctions to continue on. Then this is more of an example of how the heart functions, because all of the heart muscle is connected by these gap junctions, so the signal is able to propagate right next to each other and doesn't rely on this slightly slower process of transmitting a chemical across a gap. One important um, distinction of chemical synapses is that they are a one-way conduction. So you only have the signal coming from this end and then crossing or inhibiting this neuron here. You're not going to suddenly have a reverse and then it's the action potential going the other way. It's really a, a one-way system. And that allows that the signal is meant for one specific goal. You know, it's going to either excite or inhibit that particular neuron. It's not gonna circle around on itself. And if we go into greater detail about the synapse itself, which it goes into more detail on the following page, but essentially what happens is that this action potential is gonna get sent down this neuron. It will then activate or open these calcium channels. So then calcium will then enter into the presynaptic neuron. Due to the high calcium levels, you then get a migration of your vesicles which contain your neurotransmitter to then bind or exocytose on the synaptic cleft. So then the neurotransmitter can then diffuse across and then bind to the channels or receptors on the postsynaptic cleft. Now that will either result in the opening of ion channels, so then we have a movement of ions, and either if it's sodium, say, then you're gonna result in an action potential down the postsynaptic neuron. If it's chloride, which we'll get to, that is actually inhibitory. So if chloride enters, you're obviously gonna make your resting membrane potential more negative, so you do not have an action potential. That's one way that neurotransmitters can transmit a signal is through the opening of channels. The other way is by by actually activating a receptor, which will then activate a second messenger. So then you may get a, a quite a host of different types of changes because of that. So either you're activating a receptor, which then changes some kind of function within the cell, which we'll get to on the next page, or you're opening up a channel to either excite or inhibit that neuron. So if we go into detail about what happens with these second messengers, we have several different ways uh, that they can actually stimulate or cause an action. And that's all shown here in this 46.7 and is explained um, in this paragraph here. And you can see that our, our four different methods here, all through the activation of a G protein, can either, once again, open up the ion channels, so do a pretty similar action as just directly stimulating the ion channel to open, but they can also activate these other enzymes to then produce CAMP or CGMP, and these will go on to then phosphorylate other kinases and cause other intracellular signals to cause some kind of action within the cell. You then can also just activate actual intracellular enzymes to cause specific actions, or you can activate gene transcription. So then you tell that cell to now produce a certain protein through the activation of genes. So this is how the second messenger system kind of works, is activating these G proteins and then resulting in some kind of action within the cell. So we've talked about how you may excite or inhibit the postsynaptic neuron, and you may excite that neuron by opening sodium channels, so that will then result in an influx of sodium into the cell that will then reach, hopefully, your threshold level and then that will 
propagate an action potential down that neuron. You may have a decreased conduction of chloride or potassium channels, meaning that potassium can no longer leave the cell, which means that the resting membrane potential increases and may hit threshold, or chloride isn't able to enter the cell. So then we don't have that inhibitory effect of chloride entering the cell, so then you're more likely to excite that neuron. Or you may have just various changes within the um, kind of actual metabolism of these postsynaptic neurons to then increase our cellular activity. The main thing to think about is really opening our sodium channels. That's the easiest one, and that's the simplest way to think about it, or kind of depressing this conduction of these inhibitory type neurons. Now, talking about these inhibitory ones, we've talked about chloride. How that works is that the NERTS potential for chloride promotes chloride from entering the cell. Remember, our NERTS potential is really taking into account the concentration gradient of the particular ion across a membrane, and then also taking into the electrochemical gradient. So is there an electrical pull or push of the ion into or out of the cell? And for chloride ions with a normal resting membrane potential in a neuron, there is a slight pull of pulling chloride ions into the cell. So obviously if you're going to have chloride ions entering the cell, chloride being Cl negative, you're then going to result in a more negative charge within the cell, which is going to make your resting membrane potential even more negative. So that's getting away from your threshold. So then you need more sodium ions to enter that cell to reach threshold. So that's how it has an inhibitory effect. Alternatively, you can just increase the conductance of potassium ions. So remember, there's a slow leak of potassium exiting the cell, which was resulting in that resting membrane potential. If you increase the conductivity of potassium ions leaving, that positive ion leaving the cell, then you're just going to make your resting membrane potential even more negative. Once again, going away from your threshold, you need more sodium ions now to increase that resting membrane potential to, to reach threshold and propagate the action potential. If this is a bit confusing for you, I do encourage you to go back to, I think it's chapter four or chapter five uh, titled Action Potentials, and we go into more detail about exactly how this happens. By now, you should just be able to understand how the movement of ions influences your resting membrane potential and causes an action potential. Now, there's a short little paragraph here about our neurotransmitters. Our main neurotransmitters that we always learn about, you know, we, it's, there's a table here, but acetylcholine is one of our main ones. Um, that may have an excitatory or inhibitory effect depending on where it is. So parasympathetic typically is excitatory. For sympathetic nerves, it's usually inhibitory. Um, but a neurotransmitter isn't necessarily only excitatory or only inhibitory, um, but some are. So our other ones, you know, norepinephrine, epinephrine, our sympathetic ones, dopamine, sympathetic as well. Serotonin is an inhibitory one. Um, we have histamine here. We have got GABA or gamma amino butyric acid, also an inhibitory neurotransmitter. We've got glycine is excitatory. Same with glutamate, aspartate, and we've got nitric oxide as well. So you almost just kind of have to rote learn what you have to know and what which ones you have to know about. Acetylcholine definitely is a more common one that we think about as a neurotransmitter, but there are obviously other ones relating to which type of nerve releases it, determines what its action is going to be. And there is a paragraph just further on that goes through each one of those. And if you need to memorize those, then you know just memorize them. There there are neuropeptides and they're just kind of larger molecules and there is a table here of all of the neuropeptides. I won't go through them all, but basically because they're larger, you can just kind of think of them hanging around a bit longer. It takes them longer to make because they're bigger, hang around a little bit too long as well, or just longer than the neurotransmitters. So you only need a small number of them to cause a greater effect and it's just another way that signals can be propagated. So this is that paragraph I was talking about that goes through each of those different neurotransmitters. We have the different neuropeptides here. If you need to memorize which ones are excitatory and inhibitory for each one, it's easier just to write it down multiple times and, and memorize it. Now it starts to talk about our resting membrane potential and the Nernst equation like we had talked about before. So the resting membrane potential for a neuron is a little bit higher than our skeletal muscles 
Um, so instead of negative 90 millivolts is negative 65 millivolts. And remember that negative 65 millivolts is just going to promote sodium from entering once those channels open. So then we have a huge positive charge and that positive charge then gets spread across the axon. The positive charge getting spread is our action potential and our impulse. So that is the signal that is excitatory going to send that signal away. So we need to maintain a normal negative resting membrane potential so then when there is a signal that needs to be spread, it opens the sodium channels. Once again, chapter four or five, whatever the um, action potential chapter is in this textbook, you should memorize that if you're um, a bit hazy at this point in time. Now, one important concept here is that just because you have an excitatory neurotransmitter transmit across the synaptic cleft and result in the opening of, let's say, sodium channels, so then sodium enters that postsynaptic cleft, you may not necessarily result in an action potential. That will just slightly increase your resting membrane potential. So you may go from negative 65 up to negative 45, but you may not necessarily reach threshold. And that's really shown over here where the bottom one is the blue line and you've only had four synapses firing. So you have had an increase in your resting membrane potential, but it hasn't reached threshold. So then your neurotransmitters get broken down, your sodium channels all close, and then you reestablish resting membrane potential over the next few milliseconds. But let's say that you had eight synapses firing, you get even higher, and then it takes even longer to recover. 16, this one here, is 16 synapses firing. You get all the way up to threshold, boom, you have an action potential. Now, either you need multiple synapses firing at the same time to result in an action potential, or you need multiple in a row. So this, let's just say that this blue line is one synapse firing. If that one synapse fires again after a couple seconds and has time to recover, then you'll have another little bump. If it fires again, you'll have another little bump. So multiple firing from the same synapse may be able to bring this resting membrane potential high enough to then result in threshold, or you have multiple at the same time to bump it up and reach threshold and cause an action potential. So it's not a, uh, you just have one signal, boom, you have an action potential. You need to have a lot of signals coming through saying, yes, we need to send the signal on to then go on and be processed even further. So it is a propagation of those important signals. Now you may also have an inhibitory synapse on the same region. So that will kind of cancel each other out. You may have a flux of sodium into the cell, which would try to increase that negative charge up to negative 45. But then if you also have an inhibitory synapse at the same spot, allowing chloride from entering, then you may just stay at the negative 65 because you have both sodium and chloride entering and there's no change in your millivolts, just as an example. So that's how the inhibitory neurons work. They help to kind of combat those excitatory signals if it truly doesn't need to be sent. And that is really shown here in this 4611. So we have multiple dendrites here. So we've got um, this one over here where we've got all these multiple excitatory presynaptic neurons that get it all the way to negative 10. And that would be enough to potentially you know, cause an action potential. But if we have some inhibitory neurons just before for the actual neck into the soma of the neuron, then even though your excitatory neurons over here get it all the way down to negative 20, which would be enough to reach threshold, you, these inhibitory synapses are able to allow chloride entering in this portion, and that keeps it you know, more negative than your resting membrane potential. So even though there's an excitatory signal here, these inhibitory signals are stopping it from propagating. So that's a way that you can really regulate which signals get sent. And as you could imagine, if this is happening all throughout these multiple connections within the higher centers, then there is really this facilitative or integrative approach of sending the right signals and knowing exactly where that signal should go. Now, just for a couple terms here, spatial summation just means that there's multiple postsynaptic potentials occurring. So just like here, there's multiple postsynaptic potentials occurring that then results in summation of all those impulses. 
and then you get an action potential. So that's spatial summation because they're separated. Temporal summation just means that one single presynaptic terminal is firing multiple times, as we had talked about just on that previous page. So you just have one neuron that's sending the same signal once it's recovered, it's sending it again, really bumping that charge up. Then that is temporal summation. And then facilitation means that there is a summated potential that has managed to increase that resting membrane potential, make it more positive, but hasn't reached threshold yet. And it just maintains there, waiting for an extra signal, which may be a little weaker, to bump it over the edge. So that means that the neuron is facilitated because it's very close to reaching threshold and just needs a couple more signals to reach threshold. Now the important concept here is that the soma doesn't actually necessarily transmit action potentials, all these dendrites, they don't, they're not sending an action potential through these portions. It's this portion, the axon, which sends an action potential. What happens over here is that this fluid has such a good conductivity that reducing the conductivity over here kind of influences the conductivity in the soma. And this example is trying to tell you that this dendrite is so long that the longer the dendrite is, then you have to get a big change in this resting membrane potential to alter your soma. So in this example, they get all the way to negative 10 resting membrane potential, but they're still unable to change the soma resting membrane potential, just showing that this is very long. But this, if this was shorter, let's say that the excitatory neurons were here, you may only need to get this portion down to negative 35 to then result in negative 35 in your soma because it has a high conductivity. So it's almost like a fluid area and then that results in an action potential. Each neuron also has a different response to being excited. So if you have an excited neuron then it's going to send out an action potential. It's actually going to send out multiple action potentials and it's going to send out more action potentials the more excited it is. So the higher excited state that means more action potentials that it's going to send. Now, as you can see, neuron one, three, and two just shows how there is different characteristics of each neuron depending on where it is in the body. So neuron one, you may not be very excited, but you're able to send off more action potentials. And as the excitatory state increases, you start to increase and send out quite a few action potentials, which eventually plateaus. Neuron two, you know, you're still able to send out an action potential without being that excited, but being at the max excitatory state, you're still not sending out as many action potentials as neuron one. Whereas neuron three, you need to be very excited in order to send out an action potential, but once you've reached that state, increasing the excitatory state even further, results in a dramatic increase in how many action potentials are sent. So that's just really showing that if a certain neuron is able to actually get to a point of being excited, it's going to really send out a lot of signals saying that this is a very important message. Whereas one of these ones down here, you know, just a small excitatory state just sends out some signals. And for neuron two, it will only send out some signals regardless of how excited it gets. Just some important concepts here to finish off. We do get fatigue of synaptic transmission. So if you have a constant firing action potential, it's constantly hitting that synapse, you're eventually going to result in fatigue. Initially, you're going to have an increase in signals, but you're going to start to run out of neurotransmitters or start to change the actual ion concentration of that postsynaptic neuron. So then you're going to start to reduce the amount of action potentials, eventually not sending any action potentials at all, potentially. Acidosis and alkalosis also has an effect. So alkalosis actually results in increased excitatory ability of your neurons, so then you can result in seizures. Seizures just means that you have a lot of action potentials in basically all your neurons or just one portion of your brain if it's a focal seizure and they're just constantly firing. So alkalosis helps to make neurons more excited. Acidosis on the other end makes them more depressed so it's harder to send a signal. If you're very acidotic you may go into a coma. Hypoxia as you can imagine if you don't breathe for a bit you're going to pass out so low oxygen is going to result in a depressive effect on your neurons. We have various drugs so caffeine as everyone's familiar with or theophylline, theobromine, they are kind of caffeine derivatives they can result in an increased excitability of your neurons, keep you awake basically. And aesthetics on the other end, depressive effect, make you go to sleep. And then the last little paragraph here is just talking about synaptic delay. Mainly as we talked about a lot earlier, 
if you're going to have the transmission of a chemical across a synapse, you do have a very small time delay because you have to, once the action potential reaches the presynaptic neuron, you need calcium to move across, you need that neurotransmitter vesicle to get to the synapse, you need those chemicals to cross, you need them to then interact with the receptors and then open up channels. So that's the end of the chapter, I hope you enjoyed it. Feel free to drop a comment, otherwise we'll see you in the next video.